Thanks for joining us. Uh, just want to mention a few items that I think we can, Vermonters can give thanks for as we're going into the Thanksgiving season. Uh, first, and perhaps most importantly, I think we're starting to see some results of getting tough things done, getting Vermonters back to work, and some encouraging developments on the economic front for this great state. Uh, if you look at uh, our jobs numbers, unemployment numbers that have been released, uh, we're cautiously optimistic that we're heading in the right direction. As you probably know, a year ago we were at 5.9 percent unemployment. We're now today at 5.6 percent unemployment. I want to, uh, we have with us our Commissioner of Labor, Annie Noonan. I can't tell you how grateful I am to her for her leadership. We've been We've implemented quietly a moving our system of unemployment from an office of unemployment to an office of reemployment, and we're getting results. What does that mean? Some time ago, uh, we implemented a new system in Vermont at the commissioner's discretion, by which we changed the requirement for uh, seasonally unemployed people who need to look for new work. In the past, it was from up to six to nine months uh, that they could be unemployed without requiring them to seek a new job. Uh, we've implemented a system under our reemployment goal where that has been shortened to 10 weeks. That makes a difference. What it means is that we have implemented reemployment counselors as a result of a federal grant that allows us to work with people that lose their jobs to get them a new job. And that's helping our unemployment fund, it's helping Vermonters who need work and want to work, and it's really uh, reducing the number of Vermonters who are seasonally unemployed and who don't have to go out and seek another job during that period. So I think that's a favorable development for the business community, it's a favorable development for unemployed Vermonters who want to get to, back to work and it's good for our unemployment fund. Good news is uh, we didn't have to borrow any money for the unemployment fund. Uh, we're ahead of projections there. We intend to have a solvent fund by 2015. That helps us create jobs and economic opportunities for Vermonters, and it's something that we should be rejoicing at this Thanksgiving season. Second, uh, on the transportation front, Sue Minter, Deputy Commis uh, Secretary, is here with me. I can't tell you how grateful I am to Senator Leahy for passing the Leahy Amendment, for the hard work of Senator Sanders and Congressman Welch in helping to get that through. Uh, the fact that they were able uh, to get the cap lifted that's going to get us the transportation dollars we need at the <coughs> federal level to rebuild our highway system better than the way Irene found us is just a huge thanks on Thanksgiving for Vermonters. The fact that they were to extend the 180-day period by which we can uh, get the work done to match the 100% match requirement is huge for Vermont. So good news there for Vermonters as we go into the Thanksgiving holidays. Uh, third, on the revenue front, we've seen some encouraging news there. Obviously, uh, we still have plenty of downward pressures on our budget, but I should say upward pressures on our budget. But the fact of the matter is that uh, we right now are about, about $10 million ahead of uh, our projections on the revenue front. Those are the revised projections uh, for the first time since 2008, when we went into the longest recession in American history. Uh, we find that our revenues are back to where they were in 2008. So that's good news. Uh, this worth rejoicing. The last thing I just want to mention is the EB-5 program and how we, Vermont continues to harness the EB-5 program to get capital into businesses that need to grow and create jobs. And as you know, I've just returned from Florida where I was working with Bill Stenger and others uh, to try and bring in a whole new, uh, a whole new group of EB-5 investors. Primarily in the past, we've been focusing on Asia. I just spent a couple of days in Miami meeting with folks primarily from South America. Uh, some from India, uh, some from other parts of the globe who want 
to have citizenship in America and who want to invest in good economic opportunities in Vermont. We remain the leader in the EB-5 program nationally. Uh, we, as you probably know, are the only state in the country whose EB-5 district is the entire state. Our regional center is the entire state of Vermont. And I see huge potential to get capital to uh, manufacturing businesses, uh, tourism and recreation businesses, and technology and biotech businesses uh, to continue to grow economic opportunities through EB-5. And we'll be very aggressively promoting that uh, in the future. So just a few positive thoughts. Uh, you know, I think this is a great example. The fact that we're seeing our employment numbers go down, the fact that we're seeing our revenues go up, the fact that we're seeing uh, some of the uh, fruits of our labor uh, actually pay dividends and jobs and a better economic future for Vermonters. Uh, we have, we're cautiously optimistic that the future is going to continue to be a bright one for Vermont. Thanks for coming. Uh, uh, <laughs> When your predecessor was jetting off to China um, to promote that, you didn't think much of it. Have you changed your mind completely, and why? Well, you know, actually, I would argue that that was never the case. That was how it was reported in the press. Uh, I have always been a proponent of the EB-5 program. I did, during the campaign, suggest that my economic development strategy would really focus on trying to grow the companies that we have right here in Vermont. And of course, EB-5 is consistent with that, uh, as opposed to the notion that we are going to harness and find large companies that are going to move to Vermont that aren't here already. And that's really what my comments were constrained to. I've never criticized the EB-5 program. I've always been a proponent of it. Senator Leahy's done an extraordinary job uh, helping to keep the EB-5 program <coughs> alive in Congress. We have a challenge now. As you probably know, it expires in early 2012. Uh, I'm in close contact with our congressional delegation, Senator Leahy, to either get that date extended or preferably make it the EB-5 program permanent, since it's been such a great success. But I have always believed that the EB-5 program is a good way to get capital into businesses that need it to grow jobs in Vermont. What did you get from people in uh, South America and India? What, what are they looking for? You know, what, the, what we have going for us in Vermont is that uh, in any of these programs, there are good investments and bad investments. They really uh, are encouraged that the state of Vermont acts in a sense as the auditor for the EB-5 program. That I had uh, James Candido with me, who probably know, as you probably know, heads up our EB-5 for the state. And just the fact that uh, as they're trying to assess as an investor <coughs> what choices they might make to get a return on their dollar, and also ensure that they actually, the promises that are made in terms of job creation are realized so that they can actually get their green card and become citizens. Uh, that this, the prom, not, that the proposals that, are, that they are being told about are true. And what gives them confidence is that we're the only EB-5 program where the state looks at the program, scrutinizes them, and actually uh, acts as a partner in pursuing some of the opportunities that we're pursuing. So what I heard from investors was, it sounds to me like Vermont's not only a great place to do business, live, work, and raise a family, but it's also the only E5 program in, this, in the country where the state actually plays a role in ensuring that as much as possible the presentations that are made are true and real and will actually get us economic and financial results. To this point, the, the high-profile examples have been in you know, tourism and recreation. Uh, are you saying that there is a lot <coughs> of money, a lot of capital that will be available to a lot of uh, new industries like biotech? We'd like to see that. And, you know, one of the things that I was promoting down in Florida was the, uh, the uh, biotech project that Bill Stenger and others have organized uh, in Newport, where we're talking about potentially creating hundreds of jobs in biotech, partnership with a Korean company that uh, has a lot of potential. And uh, so I think that uh, cases like uh, the project up in Newport um, have a lot of potential for Vermont to expand not only in recreation and, and 
tourism, but also in biotech and technology and in manufacturing. Did you talk dollars at all, or was it just conceptual? No, no, we were down there actively recruiting uh, uh, investors for projects in Vermont. Did you get any firm commitments? Yes, we did. It was very successful. Can you tell us who's going to be moving here then? Which, which companies, which, which investors? Well, I, I mean, I don't know them. I can't tell you who they are individually. But all I can tell you is that uh, we had four different seminars with uh, rooms full of uh, people who either wanted to invest or were representing groups of people who might invest uh, from everywhere from Brazil and Venezuela to uh, Asia and India. And uh, we got results. We definitely uh, came back knowing that we raised capital for Vermont's businesses to grow and thrive. Uh, how much capital? I don't know, you know, and, and you know, there's a big difference between someone saying that they're going to apply and someone actually getting through the application process. But it was dozens of people, and each of them are $500,000 investors, so it's real money. And so it's down businesses. the road, I'm sorry, until they actually sign and, and make Well, you know, investment. you've got to talk to Bill Stanger about that. Uh, he was really the one who organized this, this particular conference. And i got to say, Bill Stenger is the example of how to do EB-5 right. Uh, while I was there, uh, I brought in uh, someone who's interested in buying, who actually has bought Haystack Mountain, who's interested in pursuing EB-5 options at Haystack. Uh, so the fact of the matter is this program is contagious. And if Vermont continues to do it well, we solve one of the big problems for job creators right now, for business people, which is how do you get capital in an environment where banks are hesitant to lend to some companies. So it's really a great thing for Vermont, and I think it's one of the reasons that, one of the many reasons why we're doing better economically than some other states around the country. What do my businesses were represented? On behalf of some that need right. Well, there's several projects that you should really talk to uh, James Candido. You know, I was there promoting the program, not so much the individual investments. Uh, I was sending a simple message, which is we believe Vermont has the best EB-5 program in the country for the reason that whether we have Democratic governors or Republican governors, uh, we have the support of our congressional delegation. Uh, we believe that by having Vermont as one regional center and by having the, our agency of economic development and housing actually you know, helping to scrutinize the projects and make sure that they make sense, uh, we offer a level of involvement and confidence that you can't get anywhere else. And that's a really important message we need to get out. Who are competitors? There's plenty of, you know, if you go Google EB-5, you'll see them pop up, but uh, there are plenty of there are plenty of both good and probably not so good proposals out there. And what Vermont has going for it is that we do not cooperate with projects that we don't think are real and tangible and will return some uh, positive investment. There's always risk in any investment, but uh, we believe that Vermont's EB-5 pro, uh, projects are uh, both economically viable and big job creators for us. The, uh, the issue of how to treat seasonal workers when it comes to unemployment was a subject of considerable considerable debate when the bill was going through in 09 or 10, whatever it was. Was that question resolved in, in the legislation or was it no. left to the administration to decide? It's, it's the discretion of each commissioner of labor to, as I understand it, to set the <coughs> guidelines for uh, seasonally unemployed workers. And uh, in the past, uh, Vermont's guidelines have been uh, a little more lax, perhaps over concern, particularly uh, for those that are trying to hire uh, workers during the seasonal ski seasons. Uh, however, you know, I have heard from employers, I talked to one again just yesterday, a company in Springfield, Vermont, uh, who were trying to uh, help grow. And uh, you know, many times, business people say to me, you know, I feel like we're, playing, we're paying high UI rates, and one reason is that uh, folks can stay seasonal unemployed, are able to remain seasonally unemployed without seeking another job. And I said, hey, we've fixed that. We've changed those requirements. And I think that's a good message that we should get out there. Has 
the change uh, prevented people without jobs from being counted in unemployment statistics? Who no, would have it's made no change there. It just simply says this. If you're unemployed for 10 weeks, go find a job, and we'll help you do that. And instead of sort of leaving unemployed people out there languishing, we have the resources now in each of the unemployment offices to do something different than a lot of the states are doing. We're now running a reemployment instead of an unemployment agency, and that makes a huge difference, helping people find work when they need it. It isn't that Vermonters don't want to work, it's that they have trouble finding work, and our uh, reemployment counselors uh, are helping them get that done. So the seasonal workers, they can't stay unemployed as long as they do without looking for That's work? That's correct. And, this, and the story, the anecdotal stories you heard yesterday, I heard from an employer who said, you know, I know of a situation where someone got, uh, became unemployed and they're living down enjoying, you know, the beaches in some state and they've been down there for four months. I said, maybe under the old system, but not under my administration. That's not happening. You know, they have ten weeks, then they've got to go look for a job. Are they happy with that? The Probably workers? not. But, you know, the unemployment, um, the unemployment fund is intended to cover the gap between the misfortune of being laid off and finding a new job. It's not supposed to be a uh, support system for months and months and months. As I recall, when that farm bill was passed a year and a half ago, the Department of Labor didn't want to Not that I know of. I, was I thought they had to pay more in the system. I don't believe so. Well, Annie, you want to take that one? But to the extent that it would... In Come on, down. <clears throat> I mean, to the extent that um, it might impact their unemployment um, rate, their mm -hmm. experience rate, that would be the case. Right. But there was no in independent penalty if you allowed people to... Um, if you were in a, an employer with seasonal employees and if you allowed them to... Uh, gave them a return to work date and allowed them uh, basically said you could you know you don't need to look we, we're, we're, what we've done is we have changed that we've said if you are in an, an employee in a seasonal position and you have a return to work date that is longer than 10 weeks out you must conduct work searches to, consistent with every other unemployed Vermonter which is three work searches a week uh, coming into the offices to do um, get direct help from our reemployment counselors um, coming to workshops, all sorts of workshops, whether it's resume writing, interview skill building, um, and also assessing to whether or not some of these folks may be available for special help, such as um, <coughs> programs under the Workforce Investment Act, retraining, um, uh, directing people towards apprenticeships and internships. There's a whole lot of programs that the Department of Labor administers that these folks were never connecting with. And from the perspective of whether or not, um, you know, there has been some grumbling. We have had a lot of calls and inquiries saying, you know, I don't know what this means. You know, I'm, uh, you know, I normally go to North Carolina for six months. We're saying, uh, you need to, you need to do an employment search, and there are jobs in North Carolina. If you intend to go down there, you need, still need to be doing your work search. Uh, we're not asking people to lie about their situation. If they have an employer that they're intending to return to, we are saying when you go to look for for a job, let the employers know that you do have a return to work date. Maybe it's next next April 15th, but you actually should be looking. There are seasonal employers. We just had a situation with the University Mall where I think you, one of the stations carried the story where they could not get, they were complaining that they couldn't hire seasonal people. Well, our, our local reemployment offices are now connecting the seasonally unemployed to those seasonal jobs. There are temporary jobs in Vermont, there are seasonal jobs in Vermont, and there are full-time jobs in Vermont. And, um, you know, as the employment numbers show this month, with, you know, as the governor said, we're cautiously optimistic, but with the employment rate dropping two-tenths of a percent, that was good news. But we are entering our high unemployment months, this winter months in Vermont are traditionally high unemployment. So what we want to do is make sure that we are connecting people with every job opportunity available. And keeping people connected to the workforce is a really important um, thing for them. Uh, they build new skills, they build networks, so in the future, if their normal employer, what they would consider their regular employer, for some reason were to not have work for them, they've now developed new relationships in the business community and employer community, potentially new skills. And it also helps them that they continue to add towards their own unemployment security insofar as during the period of time where they were not working, they had no wages coming in. 
So right now, if they have some wages coming in, if they were to be laid off at another point, they have a higher benefit level. So it's really a win-win in so many ways for people who are really glad to be doing this. How much will save the state? At this point, we at this point we don't know, but we project that we know that um, I think it was at least 30 percent of the people on unemployment are in a seasonal group. So we owe this, you know, we owe the federal government 77 million dollars, um, but we have not been in borrowing status, and that's really good news. And we don't anticipate being in borrowing status from the feds till the end. Uh, for the end of the year, so we're very excited about that also. We're going in the right direction. You don't have a figure on how much you're going to save? We don't have a figure, well, we don't have a figure um, exactly because we actually have to see, um, you know, but if you, you get, an estimate we don't, well, we don't have an estimate yet, Ann, because we, it's, we it's really. We have to see how successful we're going to be, yeah. mm -hmm. who we connect with jobs. So do you know of the 30% that are part of that seasonal group, what percentage found unfound unemployment? during the intervening months between the regular jobs? Well, we just instituted this in the past month um, or so. So we've actually, well, maybe it's been five or six weeks. So we're, we're starting to see re some results um, at this point, Peter, but not, we don't know exactly um, the numbers yet. But we are, you know, this could be part of some of the decrease in the unemployment for this month. So just, yeah, let me just go back up to Peter. So the commissioner came to me uh, four months ago or so and said, you know, we have this capacity to do this and this has been the policy. Do you want to change it? And I said, yes, I do. <clears throat> and so we changed it. The policy has been in place for a month or so. And we obviously don't have the data from a month's experience. But we'll keep it posted. But again, Andy, the, the type of worker <coughs> is going to be most affected by this change. Just give me a, a, a You could have the construction workers who get laid off around this time of year. Um, so the seasonal, the seasonal trend. So construction, you know, starts to wind down their season. Um, the ski industry starts to hire. So there's some connection points there. The retail businesses start to hire during the, this time for the for the holiday season. Um, come uh, uh, August, um, I'm sorry, April, you'll start to see the ski areas winding down. So those those will, those are two obvious groups: people working in the ski industry and people working in construction. But it, but it, there are other there are other groups too. And it, is it? fair to say that you viewed the old way of doing things as uh, people taking advantage of a loophole in the system to benefit financially in a way that this, the program was never intended? I, I mean, the, I don't, the, the governor's statement saying that the program was intended to, unemployment was a system that was developed to uh, sustain people from when they lost a job to when they found a job. And it was never intended to be a wage supplement program or a vacation supplement program. And I, I, I don't mean to be facetious, but we do have people that we know are on seasonal layoff for six, seven, and eight months. I mean, that's a very long time to be drawing unemployment on the business community's dime. So the answer is, as Andy just said, we want to make sure that we have a system in place where the unemployment fund isn't abused in any way by folks who are making lifestyle choices that aren't consistent with the intent of the unemployment fund. Governor, did your, this is a different topic, but I'm curious, did your security detail travel with you to Miami? You know, I never comment on my security detail because I've been told not to. All I can tell you is they keep me safe wherever I go. You can't say whether or not they were in Miami? I'll let the public safety comment on that. Okay. Why can't you tell us if they were there? I mean, it just seems like we security you know, detail with you. I'll tell you why. Uh, because in order to keep me secure and safe, they have convinced me that commenting on where they are, when they are, and how they are doesn't help them do their job. They're doing a great job keeping me safe. That means they're almost always <coughs> with me. And uh, I'll let them comment on that. Take them to your home. <laughs> exactly why I don't answer the question. <laughs> Did you get in here? Have you been? Um, you know, I've got to say that I love this job, but it's not very conducive to deer hunting. So I was out on Sunday, and I saw four doe and spike horn. And therefore, the answer is no. But I will continue to try in every hour that I can get. So you were only out for the I was only out. I was out all day Sunday. So wait, before you were governor, you saw more deer? Yeah, I did. <laughs> I saw more deer because I was in the woods more. It's tough to hunt when you're not in the woods.
not a good idea either. <laughs> Do you have a reaction to the Supreme Court case that didn't hold up regarding data mining? Now Vermont's going to be $1.7 million. Any reaction to that? I wish we'd won the case. We should have won the case in terms of the, uh, the issue at hand, which is, you know, I feel very strongly, as you know, that uh, using people's prescribing information uh, to uh, monitor whether or not prescribers are selling high-priced medicine <coughs> when a cheaper generic would do the job uh, isn't in the interest of cost control for health care. So I was disappointed by the decision. I'm disappointed by a lot of the decisions the United States Supreme Court makes. I hope we'll have a present in the future that we appoint new justices that uh, make decisions that are more in sync with what I think are the best interests of the American people. Should lawmakers be a little more careful about passing laws, though, that might not hold up in a situation like this? Well, no, in the respect that you've got to make, you have to pass legislation that you believe is going to help the people that elected you. And this legislation would have. You know, cost containment in health care is the biggest challenge for job creators. It's the biggest challenge for middle class Americans who are getting kicked in the teeth every single day. And uh, we've got to find ways to contain cost. That particular Supreme Court decision wasn't only wrong, but it also ensures that we continue to spend money on high-priced medicines when a cheaper generic will do the job. So it was a real disappointment. But you don't not take on uh, battles because you have a right-wing Supreme Court. It's a particularly difficult time, though, for Vermont to face a price tag that large. Well, you got to remember this about the AG's office. Uh, the AG's office fights cases that they think they fight cases because they need to enforce the law, not because uh, they're running a financial session. But overall, uh, they tend to win more than they lose. Uh, and there's some that you're going to have to pay out on, and there's some that obviously where fines are assessed, and they take revenue in. And that's just the nature of the Attorney General's office. So it's not a surprise that you don't win every single case that you already get. Should, should money, should the potential cost of a case be a consideration when deciding whether or not to appeal uh, a federal decision to the Supreme Court? Uh, you know, I think when you make a decision like that, you, you have to consider all factors. And obviously, you wouldn't want to go forward with a case that you thought had no chance. So, yeah, I think there's some discretion on spending taxpayers' dollars is always top of the list. But, uh, you know, I personally thought that that was a case that we would have won. I want to make the point that we did win it uh, at the lower courts and we lost to the U.S. Supreme Court. Bill, any ideas come back from the RFI and Waterbury that make any sense? What was the point? You know, really the point was to uh, ask the Vermont community and the business community and others what options did they see as potential solutions to our challenges at Waterbury. And what came back was uh, interesting. There were some proposals that were seemed to make more sense than others, but I think the overall lesson was that some kind of mixed use of that facility uh, may have potential. But none of them seemed that realistic. Of, yes, I have the ability to pull this off, and you know, the money and the skill and the connections. They were all kind of like, like a well, I wouldn't say that. I, mean, I think that the idea was to solicit ideas, and we got ideas. Uh, you know, the property, we weren't pretending to put the property on the market and uh, have buyers line up and say, you know, I want it. We simply wanted to see through the RFP process what ideas were out there that might make sense. Why didn't you have a competition instead? That's sort of the standard operating procedure. Competition for the best idea? Yeah, for, you know, for the best sort of project. I guess we weren't that imaginative. <laughs> <laughs> but you're doing an RFP now. Are you expecting more specific ideas? We want to explore all the options for Waterbury. And, uh, you know, my belief is that the best way to run the state of Vermont is to have be inclusive and to listen to all ideas. And that's really the goal that we're trying to achieve here. We got a challenge. We challenge us. You want bright people making hopefully smart proposals. Does that mean you're not going to do a ski jump? You know, 
I, I think that some of the proposals are more imaginative <coughs> than others. And sometimes imagination is good, sometimes it's not practical. What do you make of the Occupy movement in both national and media here? I'm surprised it took so long, to be honest with you. You know, we live in a country where uh, the wealthiest have never paid lower income taxes, uh, where the gap between the top 1% and the rest of Americans has never been wider, where there's plenty of discouragement that the big banks get told they're too big to fail, but small businesses don't get much help. Uh, there's a lot of frustration. And uh, I think whenever you have uh, in a democracy people standing up and saying, hey, what about me? We, the 99%, are getting left behind. Well, the top 1% seems to garner more and more power and more and more wealth. That it's a good thing for America. It's a good thing for our democracy. So my only surprise is that it took so long. I just want to clarify one thing. Uh, the change in the definition of seasonal workers does not explain the, the downward no, kick in the unemployment. Absolutely not. No connection. I just wanted to let you know, because we've never talked about it, about the new policy that we've implemented around uh, seasonally laid off workers. So where is the improvement uh, in employment uh, that would explain the uh, two kicks improvement? You know, I've got to tell you, as I talk to other governors around the country, I think Vermont's doing some things right. Uh, we are taking on tough issues, and we're getting results. And whether it's boat harnessing the wind and the sun and the water and our fields and our woods to generate power, or whether it's leading on energy efficiency, or it's whether having an environment with the best workforce in the country where we're creating uh, products that are needed around the world, We've got a pretty good story to tell compared to the other states. Is it Irene? Is it Irene construction? No. I mean, Irene, the only, you know, I think the lesson of this is that Irene wasn't as devastating to the economy as we thought it was going to be, and that's from a lot of smart decisions that were made across the state of Vermont. Uh, but no, these are, these are real numbers that are based upon, you know, a slight uptick in uh, economic activity in Vermont, and frankly, you see that reflected in the revenue numbers, too. The corporate income tax did particularly well compared to our projections. So all I'm saying is, listen, it's way too early to declare victory. We've got a long way to go. But I do think that as we go into this Thanksgiving <coughs> season, we're getting some tough things done, we're getting results, and we have a lot to be thankful for as we go into this holiday. If, uh, if, if unemployment is a lagging economic indicator, then is there anything that you look at that uh, the, your predecessor did that you think <coughs> has help the months? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, I think Governor Douglas did a great job of matching our appetite for spending with our ability to pay and joining a long list of governors, both Democrat and Republican, who really worked hard to make fiscal responsibility our top priority. We've got the best bond rating in the country. Uh, we are among the lowest unemployment numbers in the country. Uh, we don't do land speculation with irrational exuberance, which has led to the problems in both Florida, where I was this week, and you know you have whole uh, skyscrapers there with hundreds and thousands of units and hundreds or thousands, I don't know, of units. These things are huge. And you'll see nine lights on. That's called irrational exuberance when it comes to real estate speculation. We don't do that here. Uh, we've got a lot of things to be proud of in terms of our partnership between smart government and our job creators. And I, I think that, uh, you know, if you think that we're taking the credit for that from 10 months, you're wrong. It's been a group effort. There was a lot of job creators who were at the State House last week talking about the energy plan and their uh, argument that your energy plan is actually going to make it harder for them to do business, more expensive for them. Um, and they were talking about Vermont Yankee, but also about the, the increased reliance on renewables as being a more expensive source. What's, what's your reaction to that? Well, you know, I think oil hit 100 bucks a barrel or close to it again yesterday. Uh, I continue to believe that uh, as we uh, enter a world where both the planet will be unlivable for future generations if we continue to burn fossil fuels, but also where it's going to be absolutely unaffordable, and those that who rely on fossil fuels 
are going to be the prisoners of the people who produce that fossil fuel. And that's not America. So there are two reasons why we have to get off of our addiction to oil as quickly as possible. The cost is going to rise, and burning fossil fuels is going to destroy the planet. Those seems like pretty big ones to me. And uh, so I hope that as we have this debate, we'll look forward and say the choices that we make about energy in the future have to be different than the choices we made in the past. Now, I'm convinced that as we make those choices, not only are there huge jobs opportunities, but as we move to solar and wind and biomass, you're going to see the price drop, just as you did in the evolution of automobiles or computers or anything else that's driven economic development in this country and in the planet. So, you know, I was just out at the, uh, I got the award out in California last week, Green Governor. I got to tell you, we have a lot to be proud of in Vermont. But here's the good news. The other states are starting to catch on. They understand that we've got to stop burning fossil fuels, that we've got to move to wind and solar and biomass. The technologies are improving. I met with a group yesterday who was talking about possibly bringing some jobs to Vermont, who's created a really good wind machine, 35 feet wide, that you can mount on rooftops, that's going to be hitting the market soon. So new technologies are going to arrive. I believe that the price of oil is going to continue to rise. The price of renewable is going to continue to come down. It's a jobs creator for Vermont, and our energy policy is bold, innovative, and right on in terms of job creation for Vermonters. We don't use much oil in our mix now, and there's news out of Canada last week that HQ has surplus capacity. They have lots of energy to sell to New England. Um, That's all good. Yeah. But I want to disagree with your first statement. We do use a lot of oil right In now. transportation, but not in electricity uh, use. And there is just the view that I'm talking about. You can be an old thinker or you can be a new thinker. I think the message of last week was from old thinkers. The new thinking is this simple. We're going to be moving around in automobiles that are plugged in, not filled up. That's going to make a better planet. It's economic opportunities for Vermonters, and Vermont should lead on plug-ins, smart grid, and bringing together these two factors, because we are burning a lot of oil. And it's at four bucks a gallon, three fifty a gallon. It's not affordable. We can export those dollars to countries that mostly don't like us. We can keep them right here in Vermont. And Hydro-Quebec can be a huge partner with us in helping us do that. Do you see us getting more than a third of our energy supply from HQ in the future? Uh, I think that, you know, the future is, the question is, what do you mean by future? I think short term, we're certainly going to need to continue to rely on our Canadian partners. It's not just HQ. Um, the fact of the matter is that Governor Chafee and I were up in Labrador and Newfoundland uh, this summer. They're building a huge hydro project up there, and our challenge is to find the ways to get all that, that green juice that they're producing into the New England markets because they frankly can't burn it all once they're done building. So short term, that's absolutely an uh, integral part of our future. But if you really want to talk about future, I'm convinced that America and the world is moving to small, community-generated renewable power. That's our future. Storage is going to increase. Generation is, costs are going to go down, and this is no different than any evolution from Henry Ford figuring out to throw those cars together on an assembly line instead of hand building each one, to uh, Bill Gates and Larry Ellison and a team down in California moving computers from the size of this room to one that's slicing in my pocket. Bright future. Vermont needs to get a piece of this one. We can if we lead, and we're leading right now. We've got a lot to be proud of. About the upcoming session, um, now with the agreement. Um, on the cap, uh, we'll, uh, we can be relatively sure will be something uh, close to the best case scenario. So, which I think was ninety-seven million dollars or so. Uh, how can we resolve that? Through what, what's the likely combination that you'll propose of bonding versus uh, some other revenue source uh, to pay the bill? Well, the great news is that now we know that the cap has been lifted. We can actually start to work through numbers that we can build a budget on. And it's too early to tell you exactly what our formula will be. All I can tell you is, as you know, I believe that Vermont's biggest challenge is not that our taxes are not high enough. I believe they're too high. And if we can rebuild from <coughs> Irene better than the way Irene found us, without raising broad-based revenue, that's my goal. That's going to be possible, though. Hundred million bucks, hundred million bucks. You elected me to uh, get tough things done. I'm 
I'm going to try to get tough things done. I think it's counterintuitive to be raising revenue for unbased taxes at a time when we're trying to grow jobs. And we're getting some results in growing jobs, so let's not mess up a good thing. And if I could, like could I just supplement that a little bit too? Yeah. Just to, just to, just because so, the number is right, 96, 97 million. Roughly 50 million of that is related to the state office complex and state hospital, which we have to be integrated into a capital program. So that's not general funds, you know. And, and of, the, of the remainder, uh, you know, my recollection is about 12 million of it was transportation funds over, over a couple of years. That's that's doable. There's a roughly equivalent amount of general funds, which is a, a challenge, but it's not it's not insurmountable. And there was another 14 million that we might get more FEMA assistance on. It might be some general, some transportation. So my point is, if when you, even when you look at that 100 million dollar figure, it's split among various funding sources at the state level. And going back to the Ms. McConnell comment, Ms. McConnell and I are trying to solve a different problem. Vermont has the most progressive tax system in the country. I'm proud of that. Our wealthiest 1% pay more than the other 99%. I helped write that tax code as a member of the Finance Committee for member many, many years, and I will never change it. Wealthier people should pay more in taxes than those that have less. You However, Ms. McConnell has an opportunity. He's got the top 1% paying the least, and the other 99% paying the most. So my advice to Mitch would be, do it like Vermont. Ask the wealthiest to pay the most, and those who have the least to pay the least. The top 1% in Vermont pay more in taxes than the bottom 99%? Yes. We have a progressive income tax. The top rate is, I believe, 8.9% right now. And you have to make uh, 350, 250, several hundred thousand dollars to get into that bracket. I can tell I haven't been on finance for a year. I'm losing my ability to regurgitate it on the top of my head. Come on, you guys, cheer up. <laughs> Things are looking up. You're going to get a turkey this week. And uh, a couple of days off. Use it well. Says who? Go deer hunting. If any of you want to go deer hunting, go deer hunting with me. Three children this week off? No, I'm working. Yeah. I'm going to take Thursday off. Is that all right? <laughs> But put it, put it on, if you think uh, if I take Thursday off that uh, Shay's going to put that on his little vacation calendar? <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen anything like it. You know, I go on there Saturdays and Sundays. If I take a Saturday, Sunday off, it's suddenly a vacation. So is there going to be a press conference? I don't know. You're going to ask Awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hey, by the way, Shay's on vacation oh, this week. Put him on the count. Wherever you guys are, he needs to write this minute.